quizzes. Uh, not real good results. Kind of scatter all over the place. I'm not real surprised even. This is a hard chapter. And we're just <coughs> approaching halfway there now. So my strong counsel is to stay current with StatLab. I'll put this, uh, we're starting chapter six today. I'll put those assignments up either tonight or early tomorrow. I would suspect if I looked at the StatLab scores, they might be a little bit lagging behind now. Would that be a good guess on my part? I'll take that as a yes. The, uh, the real challenge in these probability problems in this section is there's so, such a large variety of the way the problem can be presented. You've just got to be familiar with all the different nuances. The calculations aren't that complicated. What is hard, I will grant you, is that to, to sort out and understand which technique I'm going to use to solve the problem. And that's to get your head spinning. Uh, answers to the quiz are up on Angel now. Today's slides will be up on Angel after the lecture. And I think <coughs> other than that, we're current. I need to get, get your stat on the science. Other than that, uh, any questions? I'm going to drag you to the quiz now. Check the answers. Uh, in the email, I mentioned to you that I will be in tomorrow attending sessions on the, the, the STEM conference, but if, if you'd like to come see me, just let me know what your schedule's like and I can break free and we can, uh, we can meet. So if you're going to do that, you need to let me know this afternoon. So uh, tomorrow morning I'm going to come in and start attending sessions unless I know that people want to see me. Okay, well on that, we will get started. We're now in section six, and today we're going to learn how to count. Yeah. So much trouble. Somebody might be thinking. <laughs> My parents or someone spending thirty, forty thousand dollars a year, and I'm going to learn how to count. My wife's skill, that's right. Well, believe me, we're going to get well beyond the ten fingers and the extra ten toes today. And this is typically one of the harder pieces of probability, learning how to count, believe it or not. Because there's lots of different ways we count to calculate probability. <laughs> So let's start kind of from the beginning. Why is a topic on counting in a chapter of probability? Well, the reason is the most fundamental formula that everything often boils down to is that simple little P of E equals S of A, which I introduced the very first day. The probability of an event is equal to S, the number of outcomes that satisfy that event, divided by N, the total number of outcomes. So much of what you do is going to come down to that simple little formula. Now, when you look at the examples that I've tried so far, the S's and N's were pretty small numbers, weren't they? We said flip a coin three times, or observe three births, or roll a dice four times. And in those cases, you could actually write down the, out the complete list of outcomes. And we often did that, didn't we? We looked at the complete list of outcomes and said, oh, that's how many there are. And of those, these satisfy the event. And you calculate the probability that way. Well, that was, those are nice introductory steps. But now we're going to get to situations where it's not easy to calculate S or N. It's not real obvious. And you don't want to spend the time, it's not even feasible to ask you to spend the time coming up with the number just by brute force you'd be here for the rest of the age of the universe calculating some of these numbers. How you count depends on the answers to these three questions. 
And I'm, I'm putting this material first because I think it's so important and that what I've seen cadets struggle with in the past is you're going to read a problem, it's going to be two or three English sentences, and you're going to look at it and say, well, what am I supposed to do? I've got six different ways I can cal calculate probability. Which one do I need? And you can always answer that question, which technique do I use? And you can answer these three questions. Is replacement allowed? We talked about replacement before when we are doing calculations of probabilities, haven't we? With or without replacement. Is order important? talk a lot about that today for the rest of the, uh, for the rest of the chapter. The order in which I arrange my items important. Or the third one, are the items distinct? In everything we've looked at so far, the items have been distinct. We did examples like I'm going to select three cadets and observe your hair color. Well you're distinct. I can tell the difference between them. But there are other situations if I was Say, for example, working with red marbles and blue marbles, I can't distinguish between one red marble and another one. They're all the same. So when I go to count them, and when I go to calculate probabilities, I have to take that into account. So counting is not as easy as you might think. I'm going to give you some examples of why these questions are important. Then we'll, then we'll get to the rules. So to begin with, Simple little background problem. Suppose I have the five vowels of upper and lower case. Right now that's my, my set. And out of those ten, my procedure in the following example would be to select five. Five out of those ten. Now let's go to the first question. The question is replacement allowed? Well, what's the impact of the answer to that question? If replacements allowed, when I'm forming strings of those vowels, of those 10, I pick five. If I'm allowed to replace them, I can get a duplicate. I could get the capital A twice. Because you can think of it, I selected it, then I put it back, and then I can select it again. If replacements not allowed, I can't reuse things. And once they're used, they're gone. That distinction is very important. You have to understand the situation is a replacement or not because that drastically changes your count of how many events there are and how many outcomes. This tends to be the real, the real killer. Is order important? Sticking with this, <coughs> sticking with this example, I have five letters and suppose that top string represents the first drawing of five of those. Now, if order is important, all I did is to shift everything to the right and I brought the O back to the start of the string. I have the same letters there, don't I? Same upper and lower case letters. They're not arranged the same way. Now, if order is important, I would count this as one result, one item, and this is the second one. I'd say that's two. If order's not important, I would say, no, that's just one. If order's not important, all I'm interested in is what letters do you have there? That's all I care. And I'd say, well, this is really the same outcome, isn't it? Because you have the same five letters. If order is important, I would say, now wait a minute, they're the same five letters, but they're arranged differently. So those are two different outcomes. And when I go to count, I will count them each as one. Are the items distinct? I can consider these first two strings of five letters. Now, if capital A is distinct from lowercase a, then I would count that as two outcomes. Because my consideration at this moment, big A and little a, they're different. But what if I said, no, an A is an A is an A. Make them all capitals. 
then these two items would merge into just that one because those A's are indistinguishable. The little, whether that's a little A or a big A, I don't know anymore, I don't care. It's just an A. And that affects how I count. So you can see those three questions, and they can be answered in different combinations, will determine how you count. All right, let's get down to it. The first rule of counting, the first rule for the day, we'll call it the fundamental rule of counting. It's a case where I have two events. The first event can happen in m different ways. The second event can happen in n different ways. And the fund rule, fundamental rule of counting says that the second and first event to get back together can occur m times n ways. Now, that's a correct, concise statement of the fundamental rule, but sometimes the English isn't very satisfying, is it? You could read that and say, well, I still don't understand it. But you know what? You do understand it, because it's really very easy. On Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings, about a quarter after <coughs> six, I'm faced with a decision. I've got to pick a pair of pants. I think I do have three colors. You probably noticed that by now. Today's black day. And I have a number of shirts, and I actually have ties too. So how many choices do I have? In a small number like this, we can do a little diagram. Two pants, with each pair of pants, I can match one of three shirts, and all together there are six combinations of those two. All right? M times N. Two, two kinds of pants, three kinds of shirts, six combinations all together. That's, that's the fundamental counting rule. I can extend it to beyond two events. Maybe I'm going to purchase a car and I have an option of a sedan or hatchback and for each of those I have five different colors and then for each of those I have three different packages. I get the V6, the stick, the automatic, how many different choices do I have? Well, it's an extension of the fundamental counting rule from two events to three. I've got two body styles, five colors, and three optional packages. The total number of choices, two times five times three, 30. And if you wanted to, you could count at this little tree diagram, the bottom nodes, you'd find 30. And this would represent picking the hatchback in light blue with a whatever the SL package is. Fundamental counting. That's the first one. Now let's use it to solve a problem. Actually, I'll. Everybody's here is familiar with social security numbers. Nine digits. Do you ever worry that we might run out of social security numbers? You don't worry about those kind of things? Yeah. Well, don't lose any sleep. But let's calculate, let's count how many social security numbers there are. And then you can rest more easily tonight. What's my situation? Let's answer the three questions. I'm going to consider each of these as a choice of the digits zero through nine. Okay? and think of these as events, nine events, and each event I get to pick one of these. Now let's answer our question. Uh, is there replacement? What would this question, replacement allow, mean in this context? Right, sir. You mean that uh, you pick nine for the first number, then a couple of numbers down, you can pick nine again? Exactly. That means I could repeat it or reuse it. So in this application, is replacement allowed? Yes. Sure. All right. Are the items distinct? Can I tell them apart? Sure. Digit zero to nine, I can tell those apart. Uh, distinct, replacement, is order important? Yes. 
it sure is, right? <clears throat> You've got to have the digits in from left to right, your social security number. All right, so that tells us how we count. For this first digit, how many choices do you have? Zero through nine, I have 10. I'm not sure if you can start a social security number at zero, but let's pretend you can. Now, because there's replacement, whatever digit I picked here and used as my first number, I put it back in the pile, I can pick it again, can I? <coughs> so how many do I have for the second one? Okay. Now, I think you see the pattern now, don't you? For each of these, we can think of them as events, an event of picking a digit for a social security number. I have 10 options. The fundamental rule says I just, the fundamental rule of counting says I just multiply all of those together. So I have 10 times 10 times 10, and so on. That's equal to 10 to the ninth. That's how many social security numbers there are. So we've got a few, we've got a few left. Maybe sometime in your lifetime, I'll go to a 10 digit social security number. But I'm not going to worry about that. All right, let's push ahead and go to some other kinds of rules. First, I'm going to introduce a mathematical notation that you might be familiar with. It's a factorial symbol. And it's to save us really a lot of work. It just so happens in these kind of problems, we run into situations where we have to multiply a long string of integers together. And often, we have to multiply them in descending order. A four times a three times a two times a one. Or it might be a hundred times 99 times 98 times, and we don't want to write that out each time. That's tedious. So as a notation, four factorial is four times three times two times one. In general, n factorial, where n is a positive integer, would be n times n minus one times n minus two, dot, 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 all the way down to one. That's our agreed upon notation. And then I'm going to ask you to give me a little bit of slack here. And we'll agree that zero factorial is equal to one. It's a bit of a stretch, isn't it? Why would zero factorial be one? Because it makes it convenient. You see why. We're going to end up with this zero factorial in a lot of places. And I don't want it to be zero. I want it to be one. So out of convention and convenience, we we'll define it to be one. And then our formulas are a lot cleaner and simpler. We'll see. All right, now let's look at the next rule of counting we have is the factorial rule. And here are the answers to the questions. I have n distinct items. They're distinct, I can tell them apart. I'm selecting them, all of them, I'm arranging them without replacement. And order is important. It, the, where the item is in this arrangement makes a difference. Each time it appears in a different place, I want to count that as a different arrangement. If that's the answer to your questions, then what you have is a factorial and the number of sequences or arrangements of the n items is n factorial. I'm going to do problems to make it. What I want you to think about first is these are the answers to the questions. When this is the situation, then you have a factorial rule. N items, and I'm selecting all N. Orders of order. Okay. Actually, that's not the example of one. Let's do this example. Suppose there are 25 cadets in this class. Now, 
You're all distinct. I can tell you apart. I'm going to arrange you in an order. Order is important. How many ways could I do that? The items are distinct. There's no replacement. And order is important. So the first cadet I pick, this is an example of the factorial counting rule. How many would that be? I'd have one of 25, wouldn't I? If there were 25. Now there are 24 left. Now I pick a second one. How many choices do I have? 24. I think you get the pattern. 23 all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1. And that is 25 factorial. Now we're also going to view this in a minute. You can look at this as two different ways. It's an application of the factorial rule or it's a special case of a permutation. But hold that thought about permutation for a moment. I don't want to get too much on the plate. It's, right now, this is just an application of the factorial. Uh, I think you need some aerobic exercises. Now start up your calculator. Let's make sure you can all calculate 25 factorial. What you're going to be looking for, you put in 25 and then go to the math button and then slide over to the right to it says PRB. Go ahead, Bob it. You're the role model here, man. You got your calculator with you? No. Your roommate took it. Anybody not find the factorial function in the calculator? <coughs> Do 25 in the math button. Slide over to the right where it says PRB. Then you get a list. And you hit the okay. 25 factorial, what's that equal to? <coughs> Roughly 1.5 e to the 25th. That's a big number. E to the ninth is a billion. <coughs> There's just 25. And if I was to count the different ways I could range 25 of you, I'd be here for longer. I'd be here for a long time. We're going to run into these big numbers a lot now. And that's only with 25. Fortunately, we have calculators. All right? So that's an example of the factorial rule and using the factorial notation function. Now let me back up here. Let's do a little bit of practice. Apply what we've learned so far. I'm sure you all have seen or probably have in your possession these magical little plastic cards that you can buy things with and they'll sometimes give you cash by just inserting it into this machine putting in four numbers. It's magic, isn't it? Wonderful. How many four-digit PIN numbers are there? First, let's answer the questions. Who wants to take a shot at it? All right, go for it. Okay. You go right to the answer. Let's answer, just go to the questions. I want you to get used to think about what the problem is before you get to the answer. Some of these are easy, but are the items distinct? The items mean each of the digits. Yes. Yeah, I can tell them apart. Is there replacement? Yes. Yeah, there is replacement. I can, in my pin, I could use the same digit twice. Is order important? Yes. Yeah, it sure is, isn't it? All right, I have the answers to those questions. So now I can think about it. When I pick the first digit, how many choices do I have? Now, since I have replacement, I can reuse digits. I have 10 here, 10 here, and 10 here. And that's really coming back to the old uh, 
fundamental counting rule, isn't it? Fundamental counting rule with a twist that I'm glad to do this. So that's 10 to the fourth. 10,000 pits. That's not an awful lot for a couple hundred million or a billion people, is it? Not real high security. Okay, let's consider pins again, but this time we're going to change the rules a little bit. You cannot reuse a number. Now how many pin numbers are we going to be? Okay, the student, how did you get that? By the 10 times 5 times 8 times 7 because you can uh, replace. At this time, it's really the fundamental, fundamental counting rule again. This can happen 10 ways, this can happen 9, 8, and 7, and I multiply them all together. But in using that rule, I had to account for the fact that there's no replacement. So that's still, uh, what was it, 5,000? Alright, this practice of this one. A lottery game requires the player to pick three two-digit numbers. How many lottery tickets are possible? Let's start by answering the questions. Get a Hamilton, I'll give you a chance here. Are the items distinct? Yes. Yeah, they're two digit numbers. Okay. Is order important? Yes. Sure is. And is there replacement? Yes. Yeah, that's not real clear here, is there? I probably should be uh, more explicit about that. Let's say that order is, or excuse me, there is no replacement. So you can't use the same two-digit number twice. Maybe in the lotteries you can, but I don't, I don't play in the lotteries. But with those rules, then how would I count the number of possible lottery tickets? Two-digit lottery tickets. And to simplify, we'll say the possible <coughs> two-digit numbers are 00 through 99. 99 times 98 times 77 times 77. Well, first I have 100. If I can't replace them, well, wait, 100, yeah. There, I said three two-digit numbers, didn't I? So there'd be 100 here, and 99 choices here, and 98 choices there. So what is that number? 100, not two digits. Hmm? 100, not two digits. But there's 100 choices from 00, zero to 99. Yeah. What's this product? Uh, 970200. 970,200. All right, let's jump ahead a little bit. So what's the probability you'll get the winning ticket? P of E equals S over N. Probability of an event, the event is I've got the winning ticket, is S over N. Well, what's N? We just calculated it. It's all the possible tickets that could be considered. It's 970,200. Uh, now, how many of those satisfy the event if you're the winner? One. So when you buy a lottery ticket, you're really making a contribution to the state coffers. Thank you. The last example. Chef has five different main courses and seven desserts. How many orders are possible? If you're the the weight person, how many do you have to remember to remember? Thirty-five. It's the fundamental counting rule again. All right. Let's push ahead. We've got two more rules to go through. Permutations, now we're going to take it up a notch. Permutations are a more general case of the factorial rule. Now 
here are the answers to the questions. There are, there are n different items. They are distinct. I can tell them apart. There's no replacement. Once I use it and put it in an arrangement, I'm done with it. I can't use it again. And order is important. Now that's the key thing you need to remember about permutations to distinguish it from a method that we'll talk about next, combinations. Permutations, order is important. If I was looking at permutations of these three letters, ABC is different from CBA. It's a different permutation. It's the same three letters, but now when I'm counting, when I'm counting a permutation, the order is also taken into consideration. So I count this as two different outcomes. And in general, how would I calculate the number of permutations of n things taken r at a time? Well, it's on your calculator, and in the book we write it as NPR. On the left, that N is the total number of items you're selecting from. Capital P standing for permutations, and R is the number of items you're selecting. So obviously R is less than N, somewhere between 1 and N. <coughs> and that is the formula to calculate the number of permutations and things taken R at a time. Let's first practice, make sure you know how to define this with a calculator, because I guarantee you, you don't want to do these calculations all the time. The calculator has that built in. So now go back to it. We're going to calculate permutations of six things taken four at a time. So follow these instructions. The first thing you enter the number six. That size, you have a calculator? Bring one. Look over someone's shoulder. Anybody back there with a calculator? Fourth row? Keys has it together. Then you go to the math, slide over to the right, select PRB, and this time you see the option NPR. Select that, and then on your prompt in your calculator, you'll see a 6, and then you'll see the NPR symbol. And now you've got to tell the calculator, you've told it, I want permutations of six things. Now you have to tell it, I want them to take it four at a time. So you enter four. And hit return, and you should get 360. Got it? Row two, three, all right, now we'll go back to the cadets uh, example. Now this one, I said assume there's 25 and I'm going to arrange all 25 of you. That's a permutation of 25 things taken 25, all 25. We said that 25 factorial was this number, but that's also going to be P2525. Just to prove it to yourself, using what we've just done with the calculator, go find permutations of 25 things taken 25 at a time. Let's do it. Put in 25. Find the PNR function or NPR function. Okay. That done. Got it. What number you got? Uh, one point five five uh, times ten to the Same number. A big number. 
So the, a permutation is a more general case of that factorial rule. The factorial rule, you're always taking, you're selecting all the items. In the permutation, you might select a subset of them. Okay. Permutations get big real fast. All right, now a slightly different problem. There's still 25 cadets in my class, but I have three chairs up in the front. And I'm going to assign you to one of those three chairs. The person who gets assigned to the first chair on the left gets an A in the course. The one in the middle chair gets a B. You got volunteers? And on the right gets a C. How many ways can I pick three of you and arrange you in those three chairs? Let's go back over the questions. Are you distinct? Yes. Yes. Is there a replacement? No. Okay. You can't be in two chairs. You won't be in one chair. Is order important? Yes. In this case, it is, isn't it? Because I've said, based on your chair, there's different things are going to happen. So I would write that as permutations of 25 things taken three at a time. Put that in your calculator, and you'll see that turns out to be 13,800. There's 13,800 ways I could pick three of you and arrange you in three chairs up here. So we could do that and take the rest of the semester, but we could actually do that. <coughs> All right, before I push your head, there's Another counting method to go. Are we open? Are you good so far? Those of you that are awake are good so far. Combinations. The big challenge in this chapter is to distinguish between a permutation and a combination. It's going to drive some of you nuts at times. Go back and look at how you answer the questions. I've got n different items and they are distinct. I'm going to select r of them without replacement. So the first answers to the first two questions are the same for combination and permutation. The items are distinct and it's without replacement. It's the third question that gets answered differently. Order is not important in this case. I don't care about the order that these items are selected. Do I have the same three items? In our example with the, the three strings of letters A, B, and C, in this case, the combination, I would count A, B, C, and C, B, A as the same outcome. Because I'm all, all I'm interested in is what letters did you get? Now, based on that, do you think in general, for the same number of items and you're selecting the same number from them, which is going to be a larger number, the permutations or the combinations? Permutations. This one's bigger? Yeah. I think permutation. Permutation. Oh, no, no, combination. Combination. How come it's the opposite? You have like a lock combination, which would be... <laughs> it's really permutation, huh? Yeah. All right, I didn't make up this language. Uh, and I don't know the history of the terms, but this is what we have. Combinations, when you count using combinations, order's not important. But the biggest number will always be a permutation. There are more permutations of a different set, of a different subset from a total set, than there are combinations. Because in this case, I would count that as two permutations, but only one in combinations. This is the formula for combinations. It's on your formula sheet, and I'm not really concerned whether you memorize all of that or not. You've got calculators to do that. Let's make sure we can correctly use them. Now look at another problem now. Well, okay. Well, calculator exercise. Let's calculate now C64. Combinations, six things taken four at a time. We did permutations, six, four. Now let's do combinations, six, four. Calculate, you put in the six, math, probability, and CR, and then a four. And you 
should get the answer of 15. Do? But the permutations was 360. You had 360 permutations of six items for the time, but we only have 15 combinations. Drastic difference. All right. Let's do an example of combinations. I'm going to invite three of you to dine at my house. Invitation to dine. This would be a real treat because my wife is incredible. How many different ways could I pick three of you to dine? Let's answer the questions. Okay, that's Seuss. Our items distinct. They are, yes. Sure. You're people, you're distinct. Is order important? No. No. If I'm just asking three of you to dine, and what I'm concerned on is which three, if it's these three guys here, that's what I count as one. You can scramble them in any order, it doesn't matter. Those are the three that will be there to die. Right, so that is a combination as distinct from a permutation when I selected three and I said, you sit here, you sit there, you sit there. And based on where you sat, there are different outcomes. Right. So there would be Combinations, 25 things, take three at a time, and that is 2,300. And now you can see why we define zero factorial as one. Works a lot better, doesn't it? Why do you say that? Because it's n minus r times r factorial. Uh, 25, 3, no, this is. That would be 25, 22. 22 factorial times 3 factorial. Sorry. I think I did a cut and paste on the previous one. And I didn't do an edit. Yeah. Here's where you get a 0. With n is equal to r, you get a 0 factorial. All right. Thanks for catching that. Now the last rule we have is permutations rule and some items are identical. And you know what, I'm going to wait for Wednesday to do this. I'll keep you even with the other class. Any questions before that? Well, let me pose a few examples to you and see, see how well we've uh, learned our counting rules. Let's suppose I'm going to select five of you for a basketball team. Is that a combination? You're play basketball. You're going to select five of you. Is that a combination or a permutation? A combination. A combination of words not important. Now, I'm going to select five of you for a basketball team, and the first person I pick will be a point guard, the second will be a shooting guard, the third person will be the center, the small forward, the big forward. But I'm counting that way, what would that be? Yeah, order is important. It has to be. Okay. I think that's a wrap for the day. Wednesday we'll talk about mushrooms. Mushrooms are